In the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Our lessons today are all about the call to vocation, to serve, to mission. Those who are called in each lesson are quite different. Despite the differences, however, I think there's a significant underlying similarity. Our reading from Isaiah contains those familiar words to God's servant. I will also appoint you as a light to the nations so that my salvation may reach to the end of the earth. A pretty significant call. God commissions the servant to go out on mission to the ends of the earth. While the call in our psalm this morning is a little bit less overt, the psalmist recognizes the implications of God's grace. Great things are they that you have done, O Lord my God. Oh, that I could make them known and tell them. And so I proclaimed righteousness in the great congregation. Behold, I did not restrain my lips, and that, O Lord, you know. God's goodness demands a response. Paul, writing to the church at Corinth, spells out two calls. The first, of course, is his own personal call. Paul, called by God's will to be an apostle of Jesus Christ. The second call is that to the Corinthian Christians. Whether corporately or individual or both, God is faithful. And you were called by him to partnership with his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. And then in our gospel reading, Matthew tells of Jesus recruiting his first disciples. Jesus invites two of John the Baptist's followers to come with him and see what's going on. And then one of those two, Andrew, summons his brother Simon to join in. Jesus renames Simon and implicitly invites him to follow. And then in the next five verses, which we didn't read, Jesus calls two more disciples, Philip and Nathaniel. Again, those who are called in all of these stories are in different situations, but I would suggest that they all reflect something similar. They were in a place of some distress until their experience of God's grace, God's call. Isaiah's words are addressed to the Jews returning from exile in Babylon. They, or the servant, were frustrated. The Lord called me from before my birth, saying to me, you're my servant, Israel, in whom I show my glory. But, I said, I wearied myself in vain. God's chosen was frustrated with its limited or unsuccessful role, so God upped the ante. It's not enough, since you are my servant, to raise up the tribes of Jacob and to bring back the survivors of Israel. I will also appoint you as a light to the nations. Through God's grace, they were given a new, grander mission. The psalmist found in a desolate pit, in mire and clay, was lifted out of that situation by God. Given a new vantage point from which to praise God, the psalmist proclaimed, many will see and stand in awe and put their trust in the Lord. Paul wrote to the Galatians about his zeal. You know how severely I harassed God, church, and tried to destroy it. I was much more militant about the traditions of my ancestors. But that zeal masked a faithfulness that was misguided until God called him to something larger, a mission like the servant in Isaiah to the ends of the earth. Similarly to the Corinthians, to whom Paul was writing, they were frustrated with their lot in life. Paul wrote, look at your situation when you were called, brothers and sisters. By ordinary human standards, not many were wise, not many were powerful, not many were from the upper class. Regardless, God chose what the world considers foolish to shame the wise, what the world considers weak to shame the strong, what is considered to be nothing to reduce what is considered to be nothing, or what is considered to be something to nothing. And then these men who were called to follow Jesus, most were fishermen, 
They may not have seen much of a future in that. One was a tax collector. And despite being a brother of one of the others, he was an outsider. At least several were pretty fed up with Roman who were ready to take up arms. Jesus called them all, representing change, representing hope. And while the story probably didn't play out as those original 12 expected, the hope they were given and the accompanying mission was enough to sustain them far beyond Jesus' death, to take them all over the, at that time, known world. And for most, inspire them to bear witness to the point of death. This is the nature of God's call to us. It's not a call to continual comfort. Our readings tell us that God's call comes to us when we're a bit stuck, wondering what's next. And God invites us on a holy adventure. It is not enough, since you are my servant, to deal simply with the familiar. I will also appoint you as a light to those you do not know. Are you curious about a different future? Jesus asks. Come and see what you might do. That's my prayer for us as individual members of Good Shepherd and as a congregation that we moving into this new year recognize God calling us to more than we might imagine, calling us out of our comfort zones into the new mission fields. That's when Jesus says to us, come and see and when we answer, we may learn that where Jesus abides may not be a place of stability, but a place of mission. This morning, we have a member of St. Timothy who's joining us, Dixon Cravens, ministers with an organization known as Family Promise, and is here to talk about that organization, perhaps as an opportunity for a good shepherd folk to come and see what we might do to be a light to the peoples alongside Jesus and the folks at St. Tim's. Thank you, Gary. Good morning, Good Shepherd family. My name is Gary Siddes Dixon Cravens. I'm the coordinator for the Family Promise Program at St. Tim's Episcopal Church down the street, the other direction, the other end of Centennial. Our parish administrator happens to be married to your rector, as you probably know. And she had a great idea last uh, fall. She suggested that Good Shepherd might want to help us at St. Tim's with our next hosting opportunity at our church, which starts three weeks from today, February 5th. So what is the Family Promise Program? Uh, when I was talking to Nadine, she seemed sounded like Many of you have never even heard of the Family Promise Program. I had not either until 2018. But briefly, the program provides shelter, meals, and supportive services for families experiencing homelessness. It was founded in 1988 in Union County, New Jersey as Interfaith Hospitality Network. And the model has been replicated throughout the country in 43 states with over 200 affiliates. It is the leading national nonprofit addressing the issue of family homelessness. Hosting churches like St. Timothy's provide overnight shelter for four or five families and, and ensure that they get an evening meal, transportation to and from the family day center on Downing Street in downtown Denver. And after a two week stay, transportation to the next hosting church. So for the next three weeks, we'll be signing up volunteers to host our Family Promise families those two weeks of February 5th through February 19th. We need about 40 or 50 volunteers to pull this off. And here are the jobs. Driving the Family Promise van. It's a 12-passenger van. We drive it to and from the day center, again on Downing Street, each day of the week for those 14 days. All aboard at 7 a.m. Many of the families have their own car, but those who don't need to use the family promise van. Van drivers must provide proof of insurance, even though the family promise insurance would come into play if there was an accident. Another job is preparing and serving an evening dinner for the families each day of the week. Meals can be brought to the church or prepared in the kitchen at St. Tim's in the downstairs parish hall. 
The families are back from the day center by 5.30 or so, and we try to serve them at six. Most of the family's parents are employed and they all have children who are in school if they're old enough. So we have an early dinner and they have plenty of time to clean up, do homework, and get ready for the next day. Another job is evening hosts. These people sit with the families at dinner in the downtown parish hall at St. Tim's. They help clean up the kitchen and they help the kids with homework or supervised activities as needed. We have an epic youth room at St. Tim's, the D zone. So a lot of the families like to hang out in the D zone. Another job is overnight hosts. They spend the night in the church with the families in one of the classrooms downstairs in the church in the parish hall. The family promise provides the cots and the overnight host brings the sleeping bag or blankets. The overnight host escorts families to the shower upstairs by the, by the office and late, late arriving parents into the church. The overnight host makes coffee in the morning, wakes the families up in time to get them on the van or on their way by 7 a.m. And ideally we have a male and a female overnight host for each of the 14 nights that we'll be hosting. The overnight hosts need to go through a background check, which I assume Good Shepherd can provide. Other volunteer responsibilities include first Saturday setup on February 4th, second Sunday cleanup and transport, laundry assistance, grocery runs, et cetera. We also need two people on the last day, February 19th, one to return the families using the van to the day center and the other to drive that driver back to St. Tim's. So there's a sign-up poster in the vestibule lobby at St. Tim's this morning that has day slots for all of these volunteer opportunities. Van driver, dinner preparation, evening hosts, overnight hosts, weekend duty, laundry, meal coordination, grocery shopping. St. Tim's had two hosting opportunities last year, one in the last week of April, May, first week of May, and then one in November. Where have we been short on volunteers? The last two cycles is overnight host and Saturday, Sunday day coverage. So to finish, and let me just tell you a little bit about each of those two opportunities. Overnight hosts is probably the easiest job of all. You get to sleep. <laughs> Most of their families are pretty wiped out by the time dinner is done. And they're usually in their rooms by 8 or 9 p.m. You get up in the morning and make coffee, sit out of grab and grow, grow, grab and go breakfast stuff, get the families moving for band pickup and departure at 7 a.m. You clean up the kitchen a little bit, lock the doors and go home. So I said before, we ideally like to have one male and one female overnight host for each of the 14 nights. So that if a guest wants to take a shower, the other overnight host can stay downstairs with the families. The other one that we're kind of short on almost every time is the Saturday, Sunday day coverage. And that's the middle Saturday and Sunday, February 11th and February 12th. We need volunteers who can do three or four hour shifts throughout the day so that someone is always on site when the families are in the building. Most of the families use that Saturday and Sunday to run errands, do their laundry or just rest from a busy week but someone needs to be at the church with them. Another easy, but sometimes boring job, especially if the weather is bad and everyone's cooped up inside. In case you didn't know, St. Tim's is a block away from a very large city park, but that may not be ideal. Next month. Please know that COVID-19 vaccination is required for all volunteers, but is not mandated for guests in shelter at Family Promise. Family Promise cannot mandate vaccinations per its federal funding guidelines. Family Promise, however, does strongly encourage vaccination for its guests and is offering financial incentives for vaccines and boosters for all families in the program. There will be strict but not onerous cleaning and sanitation protocols, which will be required for the families and which our volunteers will oversee as necessary. I can speak to anyone about the protocols at the service if you're interested in more information. As I said, St. Tim's had a very robust volunteer effort as we hosted families on six different occasions between December 2018 and January 2020 
before this worldwide pandemic thing set in. We resumed in-person hosting at St. Tim's last spring, and it's great to be involved again in this program. We are so pleased to be able to resume this significant outreach activity to our friends and neighbors in need. Personally, Family Promise is the most rewarding volunteer activity I've ever been involved in as a lifelong Episcopalian. I'm reminded of the timeless story of the Good Samaritan. Jesus in the Gospel of Luke had a discourse with a scholar who tried to trip him up by asking, who is my neighbor? After he preached that our duty was to love the Lord our God with all our heart, our mind and muscle, and to love our neighbors as ourselves. Jesus told this so-called scholar the parable of the Good Samaritan. Remember that Samaritans in that time were outsiders in that time and culture. Now we have the opportunity to be the Good Samaritan to those who many consider to be outsiders. They are our neighbors, not outsiders. I'll be more than happy to discuss any of these volunteer opportunities with any of you after the service. I'm going to hang around. You get me again at 1030 <laughs> and answer any questions you may have. If anyone wants to sign up for a slot, I'll be sure to transfer that information to our poster. This may be tricky. Uh, the prisoners haven't even seen the poster until this morning. So whatever I hear from you folks, I'll transfer to that poster. And then I'll be in touch if we have any conflicts. And after we see how we did today at St. Tim's service, as far as sign-up goes, we can always reassign as necessary, and I'll be in regular communication with, with Nadine and Gary over the next three weeks. Thank you for this opportunity to speak to your congregation about this very important and very gratifying ministry to our neighbors. Thank you.